Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Bob. I serve as director of the Alan P. Kirby Jr. Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship at Hillsdale College. It's our pleasure today to welcome you to this lecture. Launched in 2008 and located on Capitol Hill, the Kirby Center teaches the principles and practice of American constitutionalism in the nation's capital and around the country. Welcome to today's First Principles on First Friday's lecture. It's part of a lecture series that now has been going since late 2008 that addresses significant and timely political, historical, and economic topics from a constitutional perspective. Today we're pleased to have as our speaker Andrew McCarthy. He's spoken for Hillsdale College on a number of occasions and always brings with him a hard-hitting moral and political acuity that challenges his audiences. His topic today is an important one, and we're grateful for the incisive commentary he offers regularly at National Review Online, where if you have not seen his regular commentaries and blog postings, I would urge you to check those out. In addition to those writings, he's also written extensively, and I wanted to mention uh, before the formal introduction is offered by one of our Hillsdale College students a couple of those recent publications. In the American tradition, the broadside, uh, a small pamphlet-like publication, has a long and distinguished history. Recently, in, uh, uh, Encounter Books has revived that and has published a series of, of commentaries. This one by uh, Andy McCarthy is titled, How Obama Embraces Islam's Sharia Agenda. You might check out his uh, other books then, Willful Blindness, A Memoir of the Jihad, and then most recently, The Grand Jihad, How Islam and the Left Sabotage America. Hillsdale College senior Celia Bigelow, an economics major, is interning this semester at FreedomWorks. She's uh, participating in the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program, which for 40 years now has sent Hillsdale College students uh, to Washington, D.C. in a program that we now like to joke as a kind of study abroad program. <laughs> in keeping with Hillsdale's tradition of, of uh, uh, students introducing speakers for the college, I would like to now call upon Celia to introduce our speaker. Celia. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Welcome and good morning. Um, Andrew C. McCarthy is a senior fellow at the National Review Institute. For 18 years, he was an assistant U.S. attorney in the South District of New York. Um, and from 1993 to 1995, he led the terrorism prosecution against Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman and 11 others in connection with the 1993 World Trade Center bombings in New York and the plot to bomb other New York City landmarks. Following the September 11th attacks, he supervised the Justice Department's uh, command post near Ground Zero. He also served as a special assistant to Deputy Secretary of Defense and as an adjunct professor at Fordham University's Law School and New York University's Law School. Mr. McCarthy writes widely for newspapers and journals and is author of two books, Grand Jihad, How Islam and the Left Sabotage America, and Willful Blindness, A Memoir of the Jihad. Today he will be speaking on the topic, Global Threat of the Muslim Brotherhood. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Andrew McCarthy. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I love to come back to uh, Hillsdale, and I'm always happy when I get invited back, because as you might imagine, most of the time when I speak at a college, it's not a home game. Um, and, and today uh, sort of feels like one, which uh, is the way it always feels at Hillsdale. So I'm delighted to be here and, and honored to be here. Um, what I'd like to talk today about uh, is the Muslim Brotherhood, and I, I'd like to do it against a, a historical context. Once upon a time, there were two very different visions of what the future would hold for the Muslim world. Uh, it was nearly a century ago in the 1920s in the aftermath of the First, first World War. The first visionary was Mustafa Kemal, better known to us as Ataturk. 
He looked at the destruction around him, at the fact that the mighty Ottoman Empire had been shattered and its remnants divvied up by the new dominant Western powers. Ataturk concluded that if there was to be a resurgence in his beloved Turkey, uh, it would have to embrace, Turkey would have to embrace the modern world. It would have to embrace the West and its animating traditions of enlightened reason. Necessarily, that meant Islam, the predominant cultural force, the predominant fact of Turkish life, would have to be purged. Not purged entirely, but ended as the pulse of civic life. There would, be need, uh, <clears throat> there would need to be a Western-style separation, in this case, a separation of mosque and state. Civil society would become a secular space, unmoored from the constraints of Sharia, Islam's static and oppressive legal system. The caliphate, now merely symbolic as a vestige of its former majesty, would have to be formally dismantled. Now, Ataturk was a Muslim, and he knew full well that his vision for the future was antithetical to Islam's premise that there can be no division between the secular and the sacred, between civic life and spiritual life. He understood that Islam was not so much a religion as a comprehensive social system. Its imperative is to organize all of society and to dominate it, not to coexist with other systems or assume a subordinate role in civic life. That's why, for example, in Shira, uh, Shiite Iran uh, and in the Sunni kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the official law is the Quran, the Hadith, and other authorized uh, biographies and sources of, uh, bi biographies of Muhammad and sources of Islamic scripture. Nothing else but Sharia, the law of Allah, is thought to be necessary to control everything from finance to governance to domestic relations to military operations to foreign affairs. Sharia covers the full expanse of life from matters of hygiene to inquiries about the nature of the divine. Ataturk knew then that to drive Islam out of the public square, to box it into an unnatural spiritual cabin would require rigorous, relentless attention. He was seeking to revise not just a culture, but a civilization. Consequently, he vigorously repressed Islam. He realized it was not spontaneously moderate and tolerant. To make it in that mold, to remake it, would require severe state action. The Turkish government thus purged Islam from the public square and marginalized it in the classroom. Even in the spiritual realm, the new secular Turkey was taking no chances. The state took control of the country's 80,000 mosques. It vetted imams, controlling the content of their sermons and the literature they disseminated. The state endorsed the management of charitable, and, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the state assumed the management of charitable endowments, steering funds away from jihadist causes. It even regulated trips to Mecca for Turks who were seeking to fulfill the Hajj pilgrimage that all able-bodied Muslims are obliged to make. The secularists feared that the influence of Saudi Arabia's unadulterated form of Islam would be dangerous for Turks who traveled to Saudi Arabia. Finally, because he knew he would not live forever, Ataturk erected a legal and political framework to ensure the permanent shackling of Islam, or so he thought. It's an interesting departure from our own experience. The United States is a pluralist society that provides freedom of religion. Ataturk was looking to foster pluralism in an overwhelmingly Muslim society. So instead, he imposed the French model of laicite, freedom from religion, the complete banning of Sharia from legal and social policy. Finally, the role of the military, intelligence, and police forces was elevated. Together, they form the most secular and the most ruthlessly reliable institution in Turkish life. By constitution, they would now be made the secular society's constant guardian. Their highest duty, equal in importance to protecting the nation from hostile outsiders, would be to stand guard against Islamist sedition from within. They would be empowered to oust any civilian government that turned away from Ataturk's program. And in fact, they did exactly that several times before the turn of the century. 
Now, remember I said that there were two visions of the future. Well, as you might imagine, these developments in Turkey absolutely horrified the second visionary, uh, who is the main consideration for today, the principal, uh, that you, the principal person you need to consider in any consideration of the Muslim Brotherhood. Hassan Albana was a pious, charismatic teacher, a man of great passion, shrewdness, bottomless energy, and virulent contempt for the West. From Egypt, he grew increasingly enraged by what was happening in Turkey. To Bana, the explanation for the dissipated condition of the Muslim world was not too much Islam. It was precisely the opposite. For Bana, there had been too little Islam, and in particular, too little of what he considered to be the right kind of Islam. Bana was a student of Salafism, a reformist Islam that aimed to return Muslims to the principles of the founding generations, to the ideology of Muhammad, Islam's warrior prophet, to that ideology as it was understood and applied by the Salafiyya, the rightly guided caliphs. The Salafiyya had been the prophet's first and most faithful successors. They had steered the Ummah, which is the notional worldwide Muslim community, from a fringe desert movement to domination over much of the known world. Salafism is the backbone of the Muslim Brotherhood, the organization that Bana organized and established uh, first in 1928. It's essential that we do not caricature this belief system. Too often, I think, Americans are dismissive of Islamist ideology. Perhaps that's because, foolishly, our government has encouraged us for almost 20 years to ignore the otherwise undeniable facts that this ideology is derived from a very mainstream interpretation of Islamic scripture and that it fuels the global phenomenon of Islamist terror. Or maybe we are dismissive because almost everything we think we know about Islamist ideology is wrong. Islamist ideology is not all backward, anti-reason, anti-science, and anti-modernity, even though that is the way it is often caricatured. That criticism might have more force if we were talking about Wahhabism, the fundamentalist Islam that is the official creed of Saudi Arabia. But that is not the Brotherhood. And in fact, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has done a good deal to, to evolve Wahhabism over the last half century plus, beginning in the 1950s and the 1960s, when many of the brothers in Egypt actually fled uh, from persecution under the Nasser regime and found a soft place to land in Saudi Arabia. Bana's Salafist program is thoughtful and highly sophisticated. Because it seeks to destroy it, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, because it seeks to destroy us, we underestimate it at our great peril. Egyptian Salafists did not reject modernity, they sought to dominate modernity. Yes, they are Sharia determinists. Nothing is permissible outside the framework of Allah's law. But within the retrograde constraints of that framework of Sharia, they do favor scientific inquiry and economic productivity. Yes, they reject the Judeo-Christian veneration of reason in our understanding of faith. Too much reason, they argue, is not reason at all. It's just a rationalization for sidestepping the requirements of Allah's law. But they do not reject reason entirely. They granted an important role in deciding which Islamic principles apply in any given situation. The problem with the system, it's a closed system. It has to be Islamic principles uh, deciding everything. Now, why do I say that Bana's program, which to this day, by the way, remains the Muslim Brotherhood's program, why do I say that it seeks to destroy us? Well, for one thing, the Muslim Brotherhood tells us as much. Bana made it quite clear that he considered Western civilization to be the enemy of Islamic civilization. They would not coexist. Ultimately, one or the other would have to prevail. If Islamic civilization and what we call Islamist ideology are as the Brotherhood defines them, then surely Bana was right about this. The Muslim Brotherhood's official motto has never been altered since the organization's inception. Allah is our objective, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, Jihad 
is our way, and dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope, Allahu Akbar, which means God is the greatest. The motto tells us many things, but two are especially significant. First, the Quran is our law. The Muslim Brotherhood's operating imperative is to implement and spread Sharia. In Brotherhood ideology, Sharia is the necessary precondition to Islamizing a society. You frequently hear Islamist apologists in the West cite a verse of the Quran that says there shall be no compulsion in matters of religion. See, you're told, it is contrary to Islamic principles to force conversions. But you need to read the fine print. Islamists may not convert you at the point of a gun, but they are perfectly willing to, to impose Sharia by any means necessary. Sharia does not force non-Muslims to accept Islam, we're told. And that's true, but you must accept the authority of the Islamic State, and you must pay a tax for the privilege of living as a non-Muslim in a Sharia territory. Oh, and the Quran declares that you must feel yourself subdued in submitting to the authority of the Islamic State. This is the humiliation of dimitude, paying for the privilege of being permitted to continue adhering to your current religious faith. The privilege, by the way, comes with severe restrictions. They're designed to make Islam always appear to be the better option. The idea is that forced conversions won't be necessary because once Sharia is imposed, everyone will see the good sense in becoming a Muslim. And what could be more moderate than that? The second thing the Brotherhood's motto demonstrates to us is the centrality of jihad to the Islamist mission. It's really quite amazing that here we are, almost two full decades after the bombing of the World Trade Center, having just observed the 10th anniversary or the 10th uh, annual commemoration of the 9-11 attacks, and yet Americans still really don't understand what jihad is. The word literally means struggle. Some of my allies on the national security right will tell you that jihad is strictly a combat mission involving terrorist attacks uh, and essentially being a military campaign only and exclusively against the enemies of Islam. Uh, it can be terrorist attacks or it can be a formal military campaign if the Sharia state has the resources for that. But the idea is that it's only violence and nothing but violence. Um, then there are others, including some of the top national security advisors in the current administration, who tell you that that's all old hat, what they call the lesser jihad. The greater jihad, the real jihad, they tell you, is the internal struggle to become a better person. Or maybe a neighborhood's collective struggle to rid itself of bad influences like drug trafficking. It's smiley face jihad. In fact, I think if you listen to these folks long enough, you come away thinking that jihad is the internal struggle to remember to brush after every meal. <laughs> Neither one of these depictions is correct, though they both have a kernel of truth to them. You have to think of jihad against the backdrop of the Islamist primary mission, which is to make Islam dominant. In that crucial context, jihad is always and everywhere the struggle to establish and spread Sharia the legal and political foundation of Islamic society. Once you've got that down, the rest is easy. It is true that jihad originated as primarily a military mission. Recall that Islam uh, advanced by conquest, at least in the main, not by peaceful per uh, persuasion. And in making that observation, I'm not attempting to whitewash the legacy of violence or coercion uh, that, that is part of Judeo-Christian history. I'm merely making a statement of fact. Islam was spread by the sword. But the fact that jihad was primarily violent does not mean that it was exclusively violent. There's no need to engage in violence if the other side is willing to cede territory or submit to other demands. Um, so yes, it has a military component, uh, but it's not exclusively a military component. And yes, there is a personal struggle and a communal aspect of jihad, but it is saliently different from what you hear from administration officials. Jihad is not the internal struggle to become a better person. It's the internal struggle to become a better Muslim. 
and that's a very different thing, involving fa fidelity to the principles of Islam, involving compliance with Allah's law. Jihad is an Islamic concept. In terms of a personal component to it, it has to be viewed in that context. In communal terms, jihad is not a neighborhood struggle to rid itself of bad influences. Bad, again, suggests universal ideas, and we're not talking about a universal concept. We're talking about a very distinct Islamic concept. So what it really means is a neighborhood struggle to rid itself of non-Islamic influences, to become more pure in a Sharia sense. So jihad is about spreading Sharia and living Sharia. Why should that be of concern to us? Because classical mainstream Sharia contains several tenets that are completely antithetical to American constitutional republicanism and to Western culture. Classical Sharia denies the foundational premise of our free society, that the people have a right to chart their own destiny and to make law for their own society, irrespective of Sharia or any other legal code. In Islamist ideology, no law may contradict Sharia. Sharia denies freedom of conscience. Apostasy, the renunciation of Islam, is considered the highest form of treason. It's punishable by death. Sharia denies equality before the law, equality between men and women, equality between Muslims and non-Muslims. Sharia rejects American and Western notions of privacy. Homosexuality, for example, is a capital offense punishable by death. Women are whipped for everything from driving cars to socializing with men who are not their relatives. Sharia departs from American principles of economic liberty. All property is deemed to belong to Allah. The nominal property owners are better understood as custodians, and their holdings are subject to what the Islamic State determines the society needs. Sharia prohibits finance capitalism. The charging or paying of interest is forbidden, and the state is encouraged to enforce economic equality of results by redistributing wealth. Sharia rejects free expression. Criticism of Islam is strictly prohibited, as is any form of speech that would tend to sow dissension among the ummah, and truth is not a defense. Sharia features draconian penalties that defy our freedom from cruel and unusual punishments. Stoning, lashing, and beheading remain permissible penalties. As we saw in Ataturk's experiment in secularization, Sharia rejects the separation of the sacred and secular orders. It establishes Islam as the state religion and requires recognition of Sharia as the highest form of law, a form of law that seeks not merely to prescribe spiritual principles, but to control every aspect of life. And Sharia approves the settlement of disputes by violence, whenever violence is a necessary and productive means of advancing Allah's cause. This is the Muslim Brotherhood's agenda, wherever on earth it operates, and you should know that it now operates across the globe. It is not a dream because Hassan al-Banna was no dreamer. He had a very practical, patient, multifaceted plan for achieving the Brotherhood's goal of a universal caliphate, a world dominated by Islam. It was a blueprint for revolution from the ground up, starting with the Muslim individual and building out from there to the Muslim family, the community, the town, the city, the region, and beyond. At each stage, there was to be preparation for jihad, including violent jihad. There was emphasis on military training and even on suicide attacks, which are regarded as what they call martyrdom operations. But there's a very important difference between the Brotherhood and terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda. They are in complete agreement, it should be stressed, on what the bottom line is. They're both trying to get to the same place. And they certainly, for all the people who tell you that there's great tension between the Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda, they have a lot more in common with each other than they have with us, um, either of them. Um, but, but here's the difference. Um, comparatively speaking, Al-Qaeda is a crude, extortionate network. It basically wants to bludgeon you into accepting Sharia. 
It has no interest in negotiating or working with non-Islamic governments. It regards them as enemies of Islam, and it believes that sitting down with them in any way legitimizes them. The Brotherhood is much more sophisticated. For Bana, violent jihad was just one item on a menu of options. Yes, the Brotherhood uh, trains for violence, and it does ultimately see violence as inevitable. Hamas, after all, a ruthless terrorist organization, is actually the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. But the Brotherhood endorses violence only when violence will have the net effect of advancing the cause. Let me give you an example. Sheikh Yusuf Karadawi is the Brotherhood's leading jurisprudent, and he's probably the most influential Islamic Sunni cleric in the world. He condemned the 9-11 attacks, and predictably, this had all the apologists in the West going up in a balloon because they desperately want to see Karadawi and the Brotherhood as moderate modernizers. But a very short time after that, Karadawi issued another fatwa calling for terrorist attacks against Americans in, it, in Iraq, just as he had long approved of suicide attacks in Israel. We seem to scratch our head at, uh, at we, what we think of as a contradiction, but it would be easily explained if we would just study the ideology of our enemies. The United States is not an Islamic country, yet it is a country where the Brotherhood has been very successful in raising money, for Hamas in particular, in propagating Islamist ideology, and in slowly advancing the toleration of Sharia principles in our law, our culture, and our financial sector. They have a very good thing going here. The 9-11 attacks set the cause backwards because they provoked an overwhelming response. The United States militarily invaded and occupied Islamic countries, and on the home front, the activities of Islamist organizations suddenly had a scrutiny that they had escaped for a long time before. Karadawi condemned 9-11 not because violence is immoral, but because in these circumstances, it was counterproductive. It was a tactical condemnation, not a theoretical one. By contrast, Iraq is a Muslim country, and Israel is a territory that Islamists consider to be Muslim land, regardless of whether we see that claim as legally or historically accurate. Under Sharia, when non-Muslim forces occupy an Islamic territory, Muslims are under an obligation to attack until they drive the outside forces out of the country. And it does not matter in the slightest that the Western forces, if they are Western forces, think that they're doing humanitarian work to make the lives of Muslims better. Under Sharia, the planting of Western institutions and Western concepts uh, is deemed to be a provocative act of war. Uh, and even if we think we're trying to make things better for them, uh, they take it as hostile. For the Brotherhood, the plan is to do anything that works to advance the cause. They use violence when violence works. They reject violence when violence seems counterproductive under the circumstances. But in the meantime, there's always a lot of other menu items going on. Bonham believed it was just as important in terms uh, as being prepared for violent jihad to control the classroom, to cultivate the media, to rise to leadership positions in all of a society's major institutions, and to collaborate with governments. And by collaborate, I don't just mean to cultivate government officials and work with them and try to persuade them to accept Islam-friendly policies. The Brotherhood also wants to infiltrate government, to bore inside, directly influence the councils of policy, and Islamize a nation from within. It's a very comprehensive program. Its designer was no fool. He knew it would take a very long time, but when you're on a divine mission, you've got as much time as it takes. In Muslim countries, the movement is in a bigger hurry because it has the critical mass of people necessary to make sweeping changes. We're beginning to see that throughout the Middle East. What we in America like to think of as the Arab Spring is nothing of the kind. It's an Islamist ascendancy. Does that mean there are no secular Democrats and no Muslim reformers in Islamic countries? No, of course not. But we should not kid ourselves. The reformers and the secularists and the Democrats are vastly outnumbered by the Islamists. 
I think that's something that gets obscured by the people who want to see this as the Arab Spring because they compare the number of Democrats and secularists with the number of terrorists. But we're not just talking about terrorists, we're talking about Islamists. We're talking about people who want to live under Sharia law in Sharia states. And reliable polling is done in that region of the world. And that polling tells us that well upwards of half the people uh, want to live under Sharia systems. And depending on when, where you ask the question, if you ask it, say, in Saudi Arabia or Egypt or Pakistan, the number is not 50% or 60%. It's more like 80% and upward. Um, so I'm not trying to suggest or denigrate the, the, the people in the Middle East who are trying to achieve democratic reform. I'm just saying that we need to do it with our eyes open uh, and not overrate what it is. What I think eventually will happen, given the dynamic I just described, um, is that we will see the Muslim Brotherhood in the forefront uh, of the movements that are rising throughout these different Islamic countries. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood is now poised to take over Egypt. Uh, it will be the dynamic power center in Libya. If Assad finally falls in Syria, the Brotherhood will be there to pick up the pieces. It's on the rise, the Brotherhood is on the rise, every place in the Middle East where the dominoes are falling. And that every place very much includes Turkey. Ataturk's vision is now a faded memory. By a quirk of election law that was actually designed to keep Islamists out of power, an Islamic faction was actually elected in 2002. The Prime Minister, Recep Erdogan, is a close confederate of the Muslim Brotherhood. He has steadily moved the country back into the Islamist camp, hollowing out the military and the other institutions that Ataturk believed would be the bulwark against Sharia. After almost a century, Bana has his victory over Ataturk. And if it happened in Turkey, how quickly do you suppose it's going to happen in Muslim countries that have not repressed Islam with an 80-year secularization program? I think we need to be realistic about what's happening there. The plan in the West is different. It's been called voluntary apartheid. The Brotherhood urges Muslims to integrate but don't assimilate. The objective is to establish Islamic enclaves, initially small but growing uh, in various precincts. Uh, and in those places, Sharia will drive competitors out and become the law of the land. That's the method by which Sheikh Karadawi openly and brazenly claims we will conquer Europe and we will conquer America. Those are his words, not mine. In Europe, it's working. After decades of uncontrolled immigration, particularly from North Africa and South Asia, the continent is now dotted by what the authorities reluctant, re reluctantly refer to as no-go zones. These are Islamic enclaves where police, firefighters, ambulances, and other agents of state power no longer enter. They fear for their safety. In essence, these countries have ceded their sovereignty over these places to the local Muslim imams and elders. Functionally, and certainly in Muslim eyes, these enclaves, townships, and even some cities are no longer parts of England, France, Germany, Sweden, and other nations of Europe. They have been claimed for Islam, and the Ummah has no intention of giving them back. The United States is different. For now, at least, our local governments have not surrendered their authority or their sovereignty. There are troubling indications here and there, but nothing like Europe, at least for now. Our Achilles heel, however, is our law. Islamists are becoming increasingly expert at using our openness and our constitutional commitment to equality as a sword to gain acceptance of Sharia principles in our law. So, for example, in Muslim Dearborn, Michigan, or heavily Muslim Dearborn, Michigan, uh, maybe, did I, Freudian slip, right? Um, um, in Dearborn, Michigan, that's safer, right? Um, evan evangelical preachers are, were arrested on a public street outside an Arab festival. What was their crime? They were handing out copies of St. John's Gospel to passers-by. They were prosecuted for disturbing the peace. And fortunately, they were acquitted. 
but the case should never have happened in the first place. They were engaged in what was clearly First Amendment protected activity, unexceptional activity in the American experience. The only disturbance was the potential for violence by Muslims reacting to what they were doing. In effect, the police were enforcing Sharia's prohibition against preaching religions other than Islam and, in, and against encouraging Muslims to convert or at least explore other religions. In New Jersey, a judge denied a protective order to a Muslim woman who was being serially raped by her Muslim husband, who she was trying to divorce. There was no question that the man had forced himself against the, on the woman against her will. But in Sharia, there can be no marital rape because the woman is required to submit to her husband whenever he demands it. The judge declined to issue the protective order, reasoning that the husband was just following Islamic principles as he understood them. Fortunately, that case was reversed on appeal, but there are other cases popping up throughout the country, and we now have a thriving Sharia finance industry. It's vigorously supported by universities like Georgetown and Harvard, which have received tens of millions of dollars in support from the Saudi government. In Minnesota, you can even get a Muslim mortgage. The state will intervene in a sale of property, it will promote Islam, by structuring the transaction in a way that payments are, are not considered to be interest and therefore don't run afoul of Sharia. Imagine state power being used to that effect for any other religion in the United States. In 2009, the Obama administration even joined Islamic countries in proposing a United Nations resolution that would encourage member states to crack down, using their criminal law, on speech that could provoke hostility to religion. Translation, speech that cast Islam in a poor light. That this proposal manifestly violated the First Amendment does not seem to have caused the slightest degree of hesitation. Islamists are on the march in the United States because the Muslim Brotherhood has been here for over half a century. Uh, it began its Islamic infrastructure in this country in the early 1960s with the Muslim Students Associations. They started with just a handful of students in the Midwest. There are now between five and 600 chapters throughout the United States and Canada. And their mission is to groom activists for the Muslim Brotherhood or at least the Muslim Brotherhood's affiliates. In 2008, many of the best known Islamic organizations in the United States were tied to a years long Muslim Brotherhood directed scheme to finance Hamas, a criminal conspiracy in which millions of dollars were rooted from the United States to Palestinian terrorists. Perhaps the most critical piece of evidence in that case was a 1991 memorandum that the FBI located in the home of a Muslim Brotherhood activist in Virginia. It was written by the Brotherhood's leadership in the United States to the Brotherhood's global leadership in Egypt, and its purpose was to explain what the American brothers saw as their mission here. This is what they said. As the American brothers explained it, their mission was thought of as a grand jihad. Its purpose was to eliminate and destroy Western civilization from within by sabotage. You could not find a more faithful statement of Hassan al-Banna's vision. In the United States and around the globe, I'm afraid, that vision is very much alive. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We have, we have time for a few questions. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm told that I'm supposed to ask you to wait for the microphone to push your question, but sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oh, the sir. microphone. Oh, okay. Um, Mr. McCarthy, my name is Robert Petruzak. I'm a former prosecutor myself. I've read your book, The Grand Jihad. I've read some of your articles in the Washington, Washington Examiner. 
And you, I you don't have an arrest warrant, do you? No, I certainly do not, no. no. I, I no longer carry a badge. It's been a long time. All right. I'm, I'm you and me both. Okay, so we're, we're off the hook. Good. I, I, I was happily retired until I, until I read your book, and now I'm coming back, wow. making my comeback. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, I've, I've read your book, I've read your articles, I've studied the appellate opinion in the case of U.S. versus Rahman, your great accomplishment as a prosecutor putting away the blind sheik. I can't help but conclude that there is a massive, seditious conspiracy in direct violation of federal law, that its object is the overthrow of our government, nothing less, and yet our government is doing nothing. Do you disagree with that? Well. It, I think it's a very serious question. It depends on um, whether we're going to whether we take the popular definition of sedition or the statutory definition. Remember that seditious conspiracy statute that you talk about. The word sedition only appears in the title. It doesn't appear in any of the uh, of the subsections. And what you have to do in order to violate that section is levy war against the United States or use force against the government. That has to be the conspiracy. Um, if you listen to the Muslim Brotherhood people, very often they will disavow any intention to use force in the United States. Now, in my mind, if someone is trying to overthrow our constitutional system and supplant it with uh, Sharia, that is seditious, but it's not, it's not necessarily violent sedition that would be cognizable under the statute that you're talking about. Let, let me use your question, though, to make a, a broader point, um, if I may. I'm not a big fan of um, a lot of these proposals to pass laws to crack down on Sharia. I, I wouldn't like to see us be France, where they, they've now, you know, years after the horse is already out of the barn, now they're going to ban the burqa and do all this other stuff. Um, where I think the mistake is, and the reason I've written the books you were kind enough to refer to, is because I think we ought to let America work. And what we haven't done for the last 20 years is, uh, what we have done for the last 20 years, what the, uh, what the government has done, is taken any consideration of Islamist ideology off the table. So that we're, we're supposed to understand that these terrorist events happen, that they're committed for some irrational reason, that they have no connection whatsoever to any interpretation of Islamic ideology. And isn't that convenient? Because if you're the left, uh, it happens to be the left, it could be anyone, but if you're the left, if Islamic ideology or Islamist ideology is not causing terrorism, then you get to fill in the blank of what must be the cause. So it turns out to be military commissions or Israel or, or uh, uh, you know, poverty, Gitmo, Israel. I mentioned Israel, right? Um, so. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think that we can't talk about Islamist ideology because that will make us be at war with Islam, which I think is a, a loopy idea. Um, and then there are insidious people who like the idea that you can't consider Islamist ideology because then they get to say that what causes terrorism is anything that they just happen to be against, too. Um, but my view of it is, for the, and I laid out some of the, the, the really troublesome aspects of Sharia law when you stack it up against uh, our notions of freedom and liberty. I think if we talked about Islamist ideology, if we made our, uh, our dividing line between who's a moderate uh, and who's not, to be something other than terrorism. I mean, basically, in this country, I, I learned this when I was a prosecutor, a, a moderate was a, a Muslim who was out of ammunition, basically. I mean, that was the, um, and, and, but, but, but essentially, the way we've defined it, uh, uh, you know, a moderate is, is viewed only in the context of terrorism, so that if you're not planning to blow up a bridge this minute, um, you're a moderate, even if you want to throw the United States Constitution overboard it and replace it with Sharia. I think if we looked at their ideology and we looked at Sharia and we made them defend it in the light of day, you know, explain to us why you think the governed don't have a right to make law for themselves, why, why men and women aren't equal, why apostasy should be a capital offense. If we talked about it, that would be a marginal 
ideology in the United States. It would have no traction. You wouldn't have to pass laws against it because it would have no following. And the best thing it would do, to the extent that we have a real interest in seeing that real, authentic, moderate, Western-loving, patriotic American Muslims, the kind that we couldn't have infiltrated terrorist organizations without in the 90s, to the extent that we want those people to win, the only way they win is if we marginalize the crazies who want to impose Sharia. So I think the big mistake is, is not talking about it. And I think if we talked about it broadly, we wouldn't have to pass laws against it. And I'm really leery, I, and I feel very comfortable saying this at, at Hillsdale, of the notion that we want the law to pull the society along rather than the other way around. Yeah. Hold on for the mic. Yes, my name is Linda Miller. Um, what is your opinion of the movement American Law for American Courts? Um, I, I'm, of, I'm of two minds on that. Um, number one, I think that if a state um, wants to uh, outlaw its courts from resorting to Sharia law or any other body of law outside the, the law of the United States in order to interpret its constitution and its statutes that don't otherwise invoke international law principles, that a state has the right to do that. Um, and if those laws are going to be written, I would like to see them written in a way that will hold up in court, that you know, be written in a way that, that takes into account what the obvious constitutional objections are and, and uh, accounts for them and, and is written in a way that has a good chance to hold up because I think these courts are likely to be hostile to these kind of uh, initiatives. I think we're already seeing that. So that's my view of it legally. Tactically, I think it's a mistake to provoke an argument about Sharia law under circumstances where A, most people don't yet know what Sharia is and don't appreciate what the threat is, and B, um, you're dealing with states that actually haven't had any decisions where judges try to, to impose Sharia law. So it's a potential problem. I think for, tactically, for, for our side, for those of us who worry about Sharia, it would be better to have these fights under circumstances where, like in New Jersey, you have a real terrible case where, where you see the, the awful effect of infiltrating Sharia law into your system and you have a judge who's actually accepted it so that it's, uh, you know, it's not a, an abstraction, it's actually a concrete problem. I think that's a lot easier to have this argument. It's my understanding that there are three police states that have judges decide cases based on Sharia. Now, granted, most of those are in the area of contractual law, right. not a civil law. Right. Um, so going back to the movement that you mentioned in America, America Law for American Law, Do you want to Yarashalmi, yeah. But it's written, I believe, or drafted a law. Um, have you it. read that? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I've seen it, and I think very highly of Yarashalmi. And if, if we're going to have these laws, I want good lawyers like David Yarashalmi to, to write them. I just question whether we actually need to have them. My, my thing is, I want to see us have a robust discussion in the light of day of Sharia, and I, I wonder how necessary this would all be if... Well, I think that moves you know. outside of Sharia. It incorporates Sharia, but it's also transnational law that, that will be um, not acceptable in our ca no, courts. No, I understand that, but then let's have a conversation about that. A lot of Amer Amer Look, the, the, the use by the courts of international law to interpret the American Constitution is, in my mind, outrageous. But even if I'm wrong about that, it's important, and we ought to have a debate about that. I wouldn't want to have it slipstream behind a Sharia debate. That's, that's an important thing unto itself, I think. Um, let's get somebody in the back. Sir. Thank you, Andy, for your honorable and brave continuing service. Thank you. Both in this administration and in the past one, at the highest levels, it seems to many of us that the existential threat posed by what you're describing has not been understood. Uh, folks like yourself, uh, James Woolsey, Generals Boykin, David Yerushalmi, um, other, other folks who put together the Team B2, 
Sharia threat report certainly see that threat. A couple of thoughts on that. Do you believe that in this administration and in the prior ones, the senior folks who don't seem to understand the threat really don't understand the ideological basis for it, or if they do, that they believe that there won't be enough people to act upon it? And then finally, for all of us here, those with whom we send messages to, the sort of body of people below the surface who in many cases just don't want to pop their heads up either because of work, threat to family and the like, what can we do? Well, <clears throat> I, I mentioned this in, in my talk, but you know, you have people at the highest level of the intelligence um, community in this administration um, who have told, who look people in the eye and tell them that, you know, Sharia is the internal struggle to become a better person. And, you know, I wish that were true. And, and look, there's a lot of, uh, there are serious Islamic reformers um, who, who are trying to move and evolve things in that direction, and, I, and I, I wish them well. But we have to protect the country regardless of whether they're right or wrong or whether they win or not, and you can't protect the country without understanding the enemy's ideology. A and here's the problem. They want to make you think that, again, moder uh, it's, it's terrorist or moderate. Those are the two camps. And it's so, it, it's so much not that, uh, and here, here's, I think, the best example of it. If you asked people in the uh, Islamic world, would you adhere to an interpretation of Islam in which it would be proper to kill even Muslims who did not subscribe to that, uh, that interpretation of it? That is a fringe proposition in the Muslim world. You, you, when you ask that question, you get maybe 8%, 10%. Now, to me, by the way, if you do the math, it's 1.4 billion people, so that's a frighteningly large number of people. <laughs> but, but let's put that on the, on the side for a second. If you change the question and you say, do you want to live under Sharia, or should Israel exist, or is it appropriate to kill Western forces that operate in Islamic countries, even if they think they're doing humanitarian work? Those aren't eight or 10 percent propositions in the Muslim world. The, the, it suddenly then goes to 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, depending on where you ask the question. Um, what that says to me is that if we talk about Islamist ideology rather than jihadist terror, this is a mainstream interpretation of Islam. Sharia, which, you, you know, when you hear people in the West talk about Sharia, particularly at places that the Saudis have bought and paid for, you get this sense that, oh, Sharia is just this wonderful aspirational set of spiritual guidelines. It's not. Sharia is accessible. Sharia is the law of Saudi Arabia. It's the law of, of Iran. It's not, you know, when they stone somebody for violating the law of Sharia, they're not throwing aspirations at the woman. It's, it's rocks, you know. Um, they have a manual, which you can buy on Amazon, I did it myself, called Reliance of the Traveler. It's the classical manual of Sharia law. It's been accepted by Al-Azhar University, which is the center of, uh, of learning in the Sunni world. Uh, it's also, by the way, where people like the Blind Sheikh and Sheikh Karadawi uh, became doctors of Islamic jurisprudence, which, which is the source of their authority over these groups. But my point is that this is not this is not like some big, hazy mirage. This ideology is very mainstream in the Muslim world. It's not up to me to say whether it's the true Islam or not. That's beside the point. I care about American national security. I would love not to care about Islam at all. Um, and it doesn't matter to me if the Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood have Islam exactly right or if somebody else has a better idea about it. All that matters to me is it's not a fringe ideology. It's very mainstream, and therefore, it's, it's a threat to us, and we have to deal with it as such. And you can't deal with a threat and protect the country effectively if you pretend that something that is mainstream and has literally hundreds of millions of adherents is what I used to hear in the, ju the Justice Department, which is that it's a, you know, a fringe collection of loony birds in Jersey City, and if we just got rid of them, everything would be peachy, which is, is just not the case. What do you think we all, in this room, all of us who email about it, what can we do beyond sitting in these chairs that can help? Talk about it. 
Make your, make your political representatives understand that we want to talk about it. We're not asking them to outlaw it. We're not asking them to, you know, no one's asking you to go on, uh, on public television or, uh, or even television that people actually watch and, 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 <laughs> and, and torture Koran or anything. We're not, we don't want that. We're not interested in that. We want to talk about it, though. We want to be treated like adults. We don't want to be, we don't want to have people who are supposed to be looking out for us and be our representatives pretending that something is just a fringe small problem when it's a much bigger problem. And I, I really do think that the way to defeat this is to let the American system work the way the American system is supposed to work, which is we expose it in the light of day. Sir in the back. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about polling and uh, the support of uh, Sharia law and how it's, you know, 60, 80 percent. It kind of struck me, uh, you know, Sharia law is very intolerant of women's rights. How much of that polling actually are they asking women if they want to live under Sharia law? <laughs> That's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, they, they, the polling that I have seen purports to be a cross-section of the Muslim world. And it is possible to take polling from women by using women pollsters. I mean, just like, uh, you know, just like when you try to get an, on an airplane in the United States and you're a woman, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get a, a woman TSA agent to do the cavity search on you. And, and, and isn't that wonderful? Um, so no, th but I mean, they can accomplish polling. And from what I understand, you know, look, here's why I think it's pretty reliable. What I, what I, what I gather from it is that in a place like Egypt, it's about 80% Islamist and 20% secularist, in rough numbers, um, which is what you see in the polling. We had a snapshot of it when they had the referendum during, after Mubarak was ousted about when they were going to have the new constitution. And that election was, the campaign was run as if it were a campaign between the Muslim Brotherhood position and the secularist position, uh, you know, the democratic reformers who you know, the people who go up in a balloon about the Arab Spring want you to believe that the, you know, the, the Egypt is just bursting with James Al Madison's waiting to, to happen, right? <laughs> well, what, what ended up happening in the election? They got wiped out. They lost 78 to 22, which is roughly the percentage that we're talking about. I don't, I don't mean to belittle it. We want the 22 to win. We want to do as much as we can to help the 22, but I don't think you help the 22 by pretending they're 80. And closing your eyes and hoping it works out, because you know things don't work out that way. I, I actually I wish I could have tried cases that way, um, but I probably wouldn't be here, sir. We have hi. time for one more question. Hi, Andy. Hi, Thank you as always for my pleasure. Thank what you. you do. Last night on uh, Anderson Cooper on CNN, his gee, I missed it. Well. <laughs> The lead story was about Herman Cain's comments about that there are people who are trying to promote Sharia law in this country, and, and so the section was called Keeping the Modest, and he was trying to show that there was no nothing to support that, and he cited the New Jersey case that you said, and he said and it was overturned, and then he said they did it in Oklahoma as well, to even though it was preemptive, because there was you know nothing to no Sharia cases or anything that, that were even brought up. So my question is, how much do you cite the media as being responsible for stifling this conversation that you say needs to, to happen, and how would you rate the job that they do? Well, look, they're enormously um, uh, at fault, as they, as they often are. It's not, a, um, it's not a surprise, for example, that uh, Sheikh bin Talal um, who was the, the main financial backer of, of programs like the one they have at Harvard for, uh, you know, Islamic studies and Sharia law, and the one that they have at uh, uh, Georgetown uh, is also, what is he, the second biggest stockholder now in, in uh, News Corp, which runs Fox News? I mean, they're very, they're very, pardon me? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know what, what that was all about, but... Um, my, my point is that e whether they're actually having an effect or not, they're certainly trying. And, and as I mentioned in my remarks, 
Bana thought that controlling the media and controlling how Islam was presented to the media and ultimately even infiltrating the media was an item on the menu that was just as important as, as training for the jihad. And in many ways, like controlling the classroom, is a way that you can influence a lot more people, particularly in a Western setting. So I can't imagine, in terms of the day to day to day to day, the, the, you know, the, the, what people experience about Islam. Remember, there's only about you know, three, four million Muslims in the United States, how many are American Muslims versus uh, other Muslims? I, you know, I don't know what the breakdown is, but but the point is that not everybody in America. This is a big old country. Not not everybody in America even knows a Muslim. Most Americans who know Muslims report, and I, this has been my own experience, that they're very fine Americans. They they tend to be patriotic. Um, you know, to the extent it's not that you give everybody a quiz about whether they're patriotic or not, but you know, they certainly seem just like every one of us. He, here's the divide that I saw, by the way, um, as a prosecutor, and I think this has been um, confirmed again and again over, over the years. There's a big divide in the United States between the rank and file Muslims in the American Muslim community and the leadership of the mosques and the Islamic centers. If we hadn't had the help of rank and file Muslims. We could not have infiltrated terrorist organizations in the 90s. They helped us translate the, the evidence that we needed in order to present the case to the jury. A lot of them fight in the armed forces, and, uh, in our armed forces, and do so honorably. Um, they're just like any one of us. The difference is, and I found this when I tried to hire some as translators, um, I, I brought in four people because we had this big backlog of, of translations that the FBI couldn't get to. And to get an FBI translator, you have to take them off something useful like trying to protect the country from being blown up to, to do discovery material, you know. So, um, so we try to hire people from outside. And I had three or four Muslims from the local Islamic community come in. And they knew why they were there. We were preparing a case against uh, accused Islamic terrorists. And they, they were perfectly happy to help the effort. The only thing they wanted was a promise from me that no one would ever know that they had helped us. And I'm a firm believer that a prosecutor can't make a promise that, that he's not in a position to honor. And in a, in a litigation, it's the judge who decides whether, you, whether people's names get revealed or not. I told these people that I do my best, that I could see um, the way I interpreted the law, there was no reason that anyone had to find out their identities, but I couldn't promise, and they all turned us down. And it turned out that, you know, it's a terrorism case, so you always think in the back of people's minds maybe there's concern about that. But what these people were really concerned about was that the leadership in their communities would ostracize them and their families for working with the United States against Muslims. And it didn't matter that these were Muslims who had been accused of, of conspiring to do mass murder. It, it, to those people, to the leadership, it was very much an us versus them. And you're either on this side or that side, and, and that's the way it is. What I think we tend to find is that Muslims living in the United States, just ordinary people, tend to be pro-Western and pro-American. I'm not saying th these are all oversimplifications, but I, I think in the main, that's true. The leadership of the mosques and the Islamic community centers tends to be very much influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood, and in fact, by outside the United States forces. Um, you know, that, that's just, in fact, in Bana's plan, as he laid it out, the mosque and the Muslim community center in every town were what he called the axis of the movement, and it was very important to control them um, so I, it's probably not surprising that you find this dichotomy between the leadership and the, and the regular folks, uh, but it's a very, it, it, it's, it's troubling. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. <laughs>